Welcome to my best of 2022 Mandela Effect video. I do this at the end of every year to look back at the top 20 Mandela Effects that I covered that year. Timestamps are in the description if you want to jump around. But first, I want to quickly talk about 2022. This year has been phenomenal for the channel as we've gained over 65,000 new subscribers, meaning all time grew from 179,000 subscribers to 244,000 subs as of this recording. I am blown away. As for views, we've gained 6 million total views this year, and I put out 15 videos and 2 shorts. The support you have all shown has been incredible. Thank you so much. Seriously. My plan for next year is to make more than I ever have before. Organization, efficiency, and focus. That's my goal for 2023 on all three of my channels. More videos, more shorts, more mysteries, more twists, more turns, and more mind-blowing moments. Now, without further ado, here are my top 20 Mandela Effects of 2022. Please enjoy. Let's talk about a new Star Wars Mandela Effect that has a lot of fans fighting amongst each other. This particular Mandela Effect comes from Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. There is a very memorable scene in the movie where Luke, Leia, Han, and Chewie are all trapped in a room filled with garbage and water. If you've seen Star Wars, you know the scene. Eventually the walls start to close in with the intent to compress all of the trash along with our heroes. Now during this scene, Luke is constantly calling out for C-3PO to help rescue them. Eventually he gets through and yells at C-3PO, will you shut up and listen to me and blank. What is it that Luke says here? We've had some problems. Will you shut up and listen to me? Shut down all the- Is it shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level? Or is it shut down all the trash compactors on the detention level? Which do you remember? Usually lines from movies aren't the biggest or best examples of Mandela effects, but when it comes to a mega franchise like Star Wars, it absolutely matters. Fans have seen these movies over and over again. Memorizing lines verbatim comes with the fandom. So what Luke actually yells is, shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level. Shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level, will ya? Do you copy? Shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level! Is that what you remember? This may seem like a small thing, but apparently a lot of people online completely disagree with this quote. Now here's where things get weird. If you look up the scene on YouTube, most of the videos still have the incorrect title of Star Wars Trash Compactor Scene. Now this could obviously be a human error, but it's strange that video after video makes the same mistake in the title. Luke never says trash compactors, he says garbage mashers, a very different and distinct thing. It's almost as if the line has somehow changed from what people remember. Let's get into the comments. Just as expected, it's filled with people confused as to why this line is now different. You know it's a good one when you see dozens of comments across multiple videos saying, is this a Mandela effect? That is my favorite thing to read in a comment section. Which leads to the question, was it altered at some point? Was it changed on the DVD or the Blu-ray release? Or did George Lucas or Disney make this change? And if so, why? Remember that George Lucas changed his movies a lot after they were already released. It's this weird perfectionist streak that every artist suffers from. No piece of art is ever good enough, it can be better. Just a little tweak here, a couple of changes there. Because of this, it's totally possible that there could be a version out there with the original line of trash compactors. But as far as I or anyone else can find online thus far, Luke has always said, shut down all the garbage mashers on the detention level. So I'd like everyone out there to go check your VHS tapes, your DVDs, your Blu-rays, your streaming, just check and see if you can find the different one, because no one's been able to find it yet. It's really weird. So here's my question for you. Is this a Mandela effect? As in this line has somehow, for some reason, changed? Or is this the case of a lot of people misremembering and misquoting this line for decades? Anything's possible, but I leave this decision in your hands. The Scream is a beautiful composition created by the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch in 1893. Now this piece was brought to my attention by multiple commenters claiming that something had changed about this incredibly iconic work of art. So let's take a look at it. Are there any details here that you don't remember being here? I noticed something right away, and upon doing more research it turns out that a lot of people online don't remember ever seeing this gold bracelet on the wrist of the screaming figure. What do you think? So here's an interesting detail. Edward Munch created at least five versions of The Scream. The first in 1893, the second in 1895, the third in 1910, which many art historians believe is a replica painting Edward made after selling the original 1893 version. The fourth is a lithograph version, and the fifth version is the most mysterious. 
Many people believe that it is actually the first version of the Scream, as it's incomplete and lacks a lot of the colors and details of later versions. Interestingly enough, the gold bracelet isn't found in all five versions, but in the most famous version, the 1893 version, it's prominent, colorful, and once you notice it, you can't unsee it. It's such an eye-catching detail, and yet very little if anything has been written or discussed about this. You have to remember, these works of art have been discussed for over 100 years. Every color, every detail, every stroke and choice the artist made, analyzed and discussed. Not only that, these pieces have been recreated for just as long, and no one ever really seems to notice this bracelet. Even the modern-day exacted detail parodies somehow still completely miss this eye-catching golden bracelet. Very interesting indeed. So what do you think about all this? Is this just a detail seemingly everyone overlooked? Or is this the Mandela effect? Let me hear your thoughts below. In the past, I talked about a Britney Spears Mandela effect and her missing headset microphone. But today we're talking about a different effect. This time, we're talking about Britney's skirt in the Hit Me Baby One More Time music video. Think back to that video if you've ever seen it. I'm sure a lot of you have. Back then, it was honestly hard to avoid. You can probably visualize the outfit in your mind. So here is the Mandela effect. Describe the skirt that she is wearing in the music video. Go ahead, I'm listening. Most of you probably said it was a plaid skirt. As it is now, it turns out that it isn't a plaid skirt at all. It is now simply a black skirt. When I first heard of this, I remembered it being plaid as well, but I was never a huge fan of hers. I asked a couple of friends and all of them said plaid as well. So what about you? What do you remember? What kind of skirt was Britney Spears wearing in her Hit Me Baby One More Time music video? The overwhelming majority of people remember her skirt being plaid, but now it's simply black. Well, this new Mandela Effect update is in reference to that Mandela Effect. A few years back, Britney Spears dressed up for Halloween in a throwback outfit and posted it to Instagram. She was dressed in a schoolgirl outfit influenced by the outfit she wore in her music video years before. Now when this was originally posted, the Mandela effect surrounding it wasn't really known yet. The change in skirt design and color hadn't been noticed yet, but in the years since it's become quite the interesting find. In the Instagram photo, Britney is actually wearing a grey plaid skirt, like everyone seems to remember her wearing in her music video. Perhaps Britney also remembers it being grey and plaid, or perhaps she couldn't find or purchase a black skirt in time for Halloween. Whatever the case, it's interesting that she herself dressed the way so many people remember her dressing, but not how she actually dressed in the Baby One More Time music video. Was all this simply a mistake on her part, or a bad memory? Is it as simple as she just didn't look up any reference to her outfit? Or maybe she did look up her video and the skirt had not changed yet? Stuff like this makes the Mandela effect so interesting to me. Next up, we're talking about those tiny milk chocolate bites trapped inside of a candy shell. Most everyone has heard of them, M&Ms. Specifically though, their slogan, melts in your mouth, not in your hand. Now, this slogan was trademarked in 1954 and has been used ever since. So if you've been alive long enough, you've probably heard this slogan used before. You know, now that I think about it, candy companies are notoriously good at slogans. Try to tell me what candy corresponds with what slogan. Taste the rainbow. That's right, Skittles. What about how many licks does it take to get to the center of a... Tootsie Pop. You're not yourself when you're hungry. Snickers. Slogans are used to convey a message about the product that it's representing. Slogans are used to capture the attention of the audience it is trying to reach. And along with that comes brand identification. It's how companies sell products. They want to embed their name and slogan in your head so that you never forget them. The next time you're at the store, Hopefully you'll see or remember their brand and you'll have a positive reaction in your mind making you more likely to buy their product. So here is where the Mandela Effect comes in. Even though so many people remember Eminem's slogan as melts in your mouth, not in your hand. It was apparently always the milk chocolate melts in your mouth, not in your hand. That might not seem like a massive earth shattering change, but that's certainly not what I remember as well as tons of other people online. So what about you? Has it always been the milk chocolate melts in your mouth, not in your hand? Or was it, melts in your mouth, not in your hand? That's the thing about the Mandela Effect that really weirds me out. Occasionally, you'll get a crazy, earth-shattering change. But oftentimes, it's just slight changes. And they make you feel crazy. Bad memory? Misremembering? Could the solution to thousands of Mandela Effects be that everyone simply misremembered the exact same wrong thing across the world? That seems... unlikely. I guess it's possible that everyone is misremembering, but the same way? the same thing across different countries and different languages? 
This is one of those things we could talk about for a long time, but I'll let you decide. That's the point of this. It's not what I think, it's what you think. Here is a mind-blowing Mandela effect that is confusing and disturbing everyone. It's the phrase, the bucket list, a widely known phrase that refers to a list of things someone wants to do before they die. Maybe on your bucket list you have skydiving, or getting married, or traveling around the world. It's a super common phrase that has been around for a long time, but what if it hasn't? When do you think the phrase, the bucket list, was first used? Just blurt out a time period. Was it the 1930s? The 40s? The 70s? It seems like everyone has a different opinion, but all the opinions are that this phrase has existed for quite a while. But it turns out this phrase didn't exist in the public eye until 2007, with the release of the movie The Bucket List starring Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. Did this phrase simply come into existence with the release of that movie and now its simple origin has been long forgotten? Or was this phrase always around? I want to hear your memories and thoughts on this. I personally feel crazy because I made one of these lists years and years ago. Not only that, I used to work at Blockbuster back then during this time period. I can visualize it in my mind. I remember stacking DVDs of the bucket list on a side shelf. Apparently the screenwriter for this movie, Justin Zackham, had an idea for a list of things to do before I kick the bucket back in 1999 and decided to shorten it to the bucket list. This idea went on to become the plot of his 2007 movie script, The Bucket List. People have been digging for evidence that this phrase existed before 2007 and nothing has been found. Nothing. In fact, Justin Zackham said in an interview, the film's release brought the phrase into common parlance. And as a testament to how natural and idiomatic it sounds, many people assume that the term must have long predated the movie. So even Justin Zackham, the writer of The Bucket List, believes that he created the term bucket list and that it didn't exist beforehand. So what do you believe? Is he correct? Did he come up with this phrase or did it exist previous to that? Was the bucket list always a phrase? This one honestly has me scratching my head. I could have sworn this existed before that movie, but maybe we're all just wrong. Or maybe this is a Mandela effect. Another fun detail I caught on to while doing research for this particular segment, the term catfishing, as in someone who pretends to be someone that they're not on social media. Turns out that did not exist prior to the 2010 documentary Catfish. It simply didn't exist in that context until then. I'm not saying that's a Mandela effect, but I found it pretty interesting and I thought you would too. So let me hear all your thoughts on this in the comments below. This Mandela effect regarding Michael Jordan and Nike has completely blown me away. Visualize the iconic Air Jordan logo. I'm sure most of you have seen it before. It's a silhouette of Michael Jordan jumping in the air, legs spread, arm to the sky, holding a basketball. The Jumpman silhouette has been around for decades and is known to people all over the world. If I asked you to draw it, I'm sure most of you could. Originally envisioned in the 1980s, and here we are decades later, so what has changed? Well, it has to do with what he's wearing. What if I told you that Michael Jordan is not wearing shorts in the iconic silhouette, but rather pants, long pants. That's right, Michael Jordan is wearing full length pants now. Take a look. Is this what you remember? Long pants? And get this, this image has apparently never been changed. It's always been this way. He's always worn full length pants. I had to grab a pair of my own to see for myself. Is this at all what you remember? So here's how it apparently went down. This memorable and iconic image was first semi-captured in a 1984 Life Magazine Olympic special issue, then truly captured in 1985 in a photo shoot for the Air Jordan 1. That's the image that this is based off of. Jordan wearing full pants. I still can't believe this. Is this the way it's always been? Or is this a Mandela effect? Humanity understands the inner workings of the human body, thanks to all of the medical professionals who have studied the human body for hundreds and hundreds of years. What would you think if I told you that there is a new organ inside of your body that was just recently discovered? If you heard this, I'm sure some of you would think, how's that possible? Or possibly, if that's true, then that new organ must be pretty small and very well hidden to have gone undetected for so long. Well, surprise, surprise, that new organ is real, and it isn't tiny, and it isn't hidden, it's huge. In fact, so huge that it is the largest organ in the human body. It's called the interstitium, a previously unknown organ and one of the biggest organs in the human body. It's a massive network of dense connective tissue and fluid-filled compartments throughout the entire body. According to scientists, this is now a full-fledged organ that somehow no one had ever stumbled upon before. 
This next fact completely blew my mind. The interstitium is actually bigger than your skin, which has forever held the title of the largest organ in your body. It is absolutely incredible to me how no one had ever noticed or discovered this before. So what do you think? Somehow we all believe that our skin was the largest organ in our body, and now it turns out that that isn't true. There has apparently always been another organ that's even bigger. There are a ton of articles about this as well as medical papers on this if you want to read more. It's a really fascinating thing to look at. Let me hear all of your thoughts on this crazy and mind-blowing change in the comments below. Let's talk about Dwayne Johnson, aka The Rock, the former wrestler and now actor that is somehow cast in everything. Everything from the Fast and Furious franchise, to Disney's animated Moana, to the latest Disney ride turned movie Jungle Cruise. The reason I bring him up is because of his famous wrestling quote from back in the day. Can you smell what The Rock is cooking? I never watched wrestling growing up, but even I had heard of this quote. So come to find out, that isn't actually what he says. In fact, he never said, can you smell what The Rock is cooking? His quote is actually, if you smell what the rock is cooking. If, not can. This might seem like a small grammatical difference, but it fundamentally changes the meaning of the quote. Not only are there multiple threads online discussing this weird change, but numerous comments from people all over YouTube remembering this quote being can, not if. This misspoken and misquoted line isn't just limited to audio and video clips. It's quoted on t-shirts, media pieces about the rock, and dozens and dozens of articles. Is it possible that everyone is wrong and this is just a mistake that keeps being repeated? Or is this another example of the Mandela Effect? In my research for this, I found videos saying can in the title, but when you watch it, he says if. I even looked up his wrestling theme song to see what it says, and it says if you smell what the rock is cooking. So what do you remember? Has it always been if you smell what the rock is cooking, or has something changed? I'm curious to hear which one you remember. I've got a fantastic new Mandela effect to share with all of you. Hypnotic, the flavored drink that I've spoken about before, has changed again. I talked about its original Mandela effect back in Brand New Mandela Effects Part 15, and how its name had changed. The spelling was completely off. I'm going to show that clip now and catch you up. And when we come back, I'm going to tell you what has changed now. So pay very close attention to every detail. Alcohol is consumed all over the world, and with so many manufacturers, it can be hard to really stand out and get your product noticed. The newly created vodka, cognac, and fruit flavored brand Hypnotic was created in 2001, and it found it by creating a liquor that literally sparkled. Shaking up a bottle of Hypnotic created a glitter-like sparkle effect that became an instant hit. In fact, that's the only reason I personally know of Hypnotic. A friend saw it on a shelf and bought it, and no doubt, the sparkle makes it very memorable. And honestly, you can't say that about most liquors. So here is where the Mandela Effect comes in. If you have ever had this drink before, or purchased a bottle of it, or simply seen it on a store shelf, the sparkle, the design, the name, it's all very memorable. So here's the question, how is hypnotic spelled? Is it spelled hypnotic, hypnotic, or hypnotic? If you're like me, you remember it being hypnotic, with a Y and a Q. And that's understandable. It's a slight spelling variation of the word hypnotic so that they could trademark the name. But you'd be wrong. It's actually hypnotic with that really strange spelling. That spelling is absurd. Not just in the sense that it's purposefully confusing, but it's a pain on the eyes. I've seen this drink hundreds of times. I've even held the bottle in my hands on multiple occasions. This is absolutely something I would have noticed. But here we are. Has hypnotic always been spelled like this, or is this another example of the Mandela effect? Let me know. Now that you're up to date with what I said then, this will more likely blow your mind. Hypnotic is no longer shiny. It doesn't sparkle. It doesn't have that beautiful glitter effect anymore. As of now, it is just solid blue. How is it that I made an entire video segment on this drink? And not only did I somehow not notice that the drink didn't sparkle, but not a single commenter noticed either. That video has 119,000 views as of right now. In all that time, with all of the people who commented that they were bartenders and they made hypnotic drinks all the time, or that they love drinking this, or that they used to party all the time, etc. How is it that no one noticed? In fact, the first comment to mention that it doesn't sparkle, or hasn't ever sparkled, was from nine days ago. Here's that comment. Not a single comment before this one, in the two years since this video has been released, has said otherwise. And I know this because I checked. In fact, I looked up every term I could think of in the comments. Sparkle, shine, 
shimmer, glitter, shiny, nothing. Something very similar happened in my last video. I went back and looked at my favorite Mandela effect from a video I made three years before. The changes that had happened since I first talked about it were unbelievable. And here we are again, where I have a dedicated video segment on a topic that has now changed. This means that the research that I did, the script that I wrote, the audio recording of me reading that script, and the images I used are now retroactively wrong. I'm honestly not even mad. I'm amazed. When I made that original video, I obviously believed that Hypnotic sparkled. I included not just my voice mentioning that point, but also what I thought were photos that showed that. I even added glittery blue backgrounds to further represent the shimmer. I also specifically remember going to my favorite liquor store downtown when I first heard this drink's name had changed and checking for myself. So, what is going on here? Let's get to the bottom of this. First up is the idea that maybe I was mistaking this for another sparkling drink. Upon doing some research, I found a French drink called Nouveau Sparkling Liqueur. Apparently this was the first drink to sparkle like I remember hypnotic sparkling. This bottle was modeled to give off a perfume-like design and originally displayed the words for her on it. I have never heard of this drink before and there is no way that I could have mistaken this drink for hypnotic. Besides, look at the color, it's completely different. Next up is a drink from hypnotic themselves called Hypnotic Sparkle, released in 2014. I can't make this stuff up. I'm looking for a sparkly bottle of hypnotic that apparently doesn't exist and now there is a specific sparkling variant of hypnotic. At first I thought, mystery solved. That is, until I saw the bottle. Not only does this bottle have a different branding and look to it compared to regular hypnotic, it also isn't sparkly. There is no glittery shine to it. It's simply bubbly, like champagne. The sparkle of hypnotic sparkle is carbonation. Not glitter or whatever it was that made it sparkly like a lot of us remember. We are two for two right now, so maybe this next and final answer is the one we're looking for. In 2015, a brand name Vinique was released. Now this stuff was sparkly from what I found online about it. Apparently it was discontinued for unknown or undisclosed reasons between 2019 and 2020. If I had to guess, you were straight up drinking glitter. So is it possible that everyone that remembers Hypnotic being shiny, myself included, was actually thinking of Vinique? I really don't know, and I can't answer for everyone. Personally, I had never heard of or seen this brand before today. And looking more into it, the colors available for Vinique were dark purple and later on red and orange. There wasn't even a blue shade, let alone a light blue shade. So I spent hours looking into this because I get super obsessive over things that really interest me. And I found this really neat. There is an article by MASH.com about the untold truth of Vanique Shimmery Liqueur. This article goes on to describe the history of this drink, as well as show off a ton of amazing photos of this beverage. I wonder if it was any good. Let me know if you had this before it was removed from the market. Anyway, the 2022 article goes on to, strangely enough, mention Hypnotic, of all things, a brand that was apparently never shiny. So why was it brought up in an article about this shiny drink? Unless perhaps the author, for some reason, in their mind, associated Hypnotic as a shiny drink as well. In fact, it was totally unrelated to Vinique, as both targeted different demographics. Gen X for Hypnotic and Millennials for Vinique. Not to mention Hypnotic came out in 2001 and Vinique came out in 2015, a full 14 years later. I don't see how or why these two disparate bottles would be compared in an article, but they are. The article goes on to say, Vinique Shimmering Liqueur was the first shimmering liqueur specifically designed for the American market. Before Vinique, there were a few smaller and lesser known drinks like France's Nouveau that had a much subtler effect. Although liqueurs like Hypnotic capitalized on bright and bold drink flavors, Vinique was the first brand to not only combine the two, but to really strive for a drink that looks like pure glitter. So already, I would pause. How did Vinique combine the two? Vinique launched as a glittery dark purple drink. Hypnotic was a bright blue drink that was apparently never glittery. They are completely different. One is dark and shiny, and one is bright blue and apparently not shiny. Where is this association coming from anyway? If Hypnotic was never shiny, this is a random non sequitur. It's irrelevant to bring up. Unless it's the exact same association that I and so many others now have for completely unknown reasons. Also, I'd like to point out that they spelled Hypnotic with the old spelling in that article. The spelling that is now considered incorrect. This article is a great piece of residue for both hypnotic Mandela effects. So what do you think about this Mandela effect? Do you remember the glitter or the name being spelled differently like so many others? Or is this how hypnotic always was? Perhaps I'm simply thinking of another drink in a different color that I've never seen, had, or heard of before. Is it truly as simple as that? Or is this another example of the Mandela effect? Tell me your thoughts in the comments below.
This Mandela Effect is in regards to the 2016 hero-based multiplayer first-person shooter video game, Overwatch. Now this game was extremely popular and addictive, meaning players would often play match after match, hour after hour. After enough time of playing, it wouldn't be uncommon to know all of the characters, all of the moves, all of the maps and modes, as well as the dialogue between the different characters. This is pretty common among multiplayer games and their fans. But in the case of Overwatch, there was apparently dialogue between two characters that a lot of people seem to remember, but was never actually said. In fact, it never existed. Apparently, it was one of the random interactions before a match starts between Reaper and Mercy. Mercy would say, this isn't what I intended for you, Reyes, and Reaper would respond with, you know exactly what you were doing. This line would have been significant regarding the overall story and lore for Overwatch because it suggests that Mercy had something to do with transforming Gabriel Reyes into Reaper, which also implies that Mercy isn't the saint she portrays herself to be. Except this line apparently was never written, never recorded, and never actually put into Overwatch. How do we know this? Well, for starters, the former lead writer of Overwatch, Michael Chu, has come out on multiple occasions on forums and on Twitter to denounce the existence of these lines. He's even come out before and said lines like this, I'm not sure where this came from. Maybe there's another line that sounds similar to it, but the this is not what I intended for you, Reyes, line slash exchange does not actually exist in the game. If anyone would know this, it would be the lead writer of the game, but the mystery surrounding these lines of dialogue continued. If you look this up on a search engine, you'll find countless examples of people talking about this missing dialogue. What happened to it? Where did it go? Was it actually real? Some Overwatch players have data mined the game in an attempt to extract extra details, information, and potential secrets in its files, but within that data, there are no lines of dialogue like the ones some people seem to remember. Some have argued online that they remember hearing the dialogue in the beta for Overwatch, as in the nearly complete but not quite finished version of the game that you could play before its official release. Now this right here could be the smoking gun to solving this Mandela effect, but then it was revealed that numerous players who had never played the beta, only the official release, had heard this line as well. So unfortunately, that couldn't be the solution. So what now? Where did this come from? Honestly, at this point, it would probably be a relief to my sanity if someone found a recording of those voice lines, is what the former lead writer shared on Twitter. This Mandela effect is especially interesting for three reasons. The first is that Overwatch has been officially shut down because Overwatch 2 recently came out, meaning you can't play the original anymore. They instead want you to go to the sequel. The second reason is that tens of millions of players around the world have played the first game. So if this dialogue actually existed, there has to be someone, somewhere out there in the world, that has captured it. The third and final reason is because of the staggering amount of people who have played this game, and the fact that the game is now unplayable, this makes this Mandela effect truly lost, unless something of a miracle happens. If you played Overwatch 1 before it was shut down, have you ever heard this line before? Is this a Mandela effect? Or was this a change to the lore of Overwatch and Blizzard, its developer, is just gaslighting everyone? If this bit of dialogue does exist out there, somewhere in all of the footage on YouTube and Twitch of Overwatch, someone must have captured it. Honestly, with the Mandela Effect, you never really know. Sometimes things just disappear. Recently on the television show Wheel of Fortune, a contestant had to solve a puzzle for a song lyric. Sweet dreams are made of blank. The contestant got it wrong and lost a potential $4,000 extra in winnings, but luckily went on to still win the episode. What was his answer? He said, sweet dreams are made of these. The correct answer is apparently sweet dreams are made of this. The lyrics come from a famous 1983 Eurythmics song titled Sweet Dreams. This caused a ton of confusion online, leading to multiple articles being written about not just this contestant losing, but also about how this lyric has been misheard for decades. That detail right there is what really interests me. The articles written didn't solely exist to make fun of the guy for saying the obviously wrong word in the puzzle. It's that even the writers of the article thought it was, sweet dreams are made of these. Once I read a few of these articles, I couldn't stop researching this. How is it that so many people could have misheard this song lyric for so many years? And it begs the question, is it really as simple as everyone is misremembering the lyrics? Or is this a Mandela effect? I'm curious to hear what you all remember. In the song by the Eurythmics, the way this is said is extremely exaggerated, so perhaps that exaggeration is the cause of all this confusion. But I read multiple comments of people saying that these sounds better than this, especially with the flow of the song and the rhyming of the song. So what do you think about this? One of these articles that I read, the top comment underneath it was, Sweet dreams are made of this? I was today years old when I learned that these isn't the correct lyric. One last detail I bring up about this is the Marilyn Manson cover of this song. 
where the debate continues to rage. So I gave the song a listen with headphones on, and it does sound like these, but the lyrics for it say this. It's just weird. Is this all misremembering or mishearing, or has something actually changed? Jackie Robinson was not only a great baseball player, but actually the first black athlete to ever play Major League Baseball, all the way back in 1947. He was even inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962. This next Mandela Effect has to do with him. And don't worry, you don't need to understand any sports knowledge for this to land, because this one has to do with a hug. More on that in a second. The date is May 13th, 1947. The game is between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Cincinnati Reds. Jackie Robinson had only been in the major leagues for a month at this point. Because he was the first black athlete to play in the MLB, and the fact that it was 1947, racial tension was sadly still at an all-time high. In fact, some of his own teammates had asked management to trade them away rather than play baseball with him. Not only that, his opponents threatened to boycott. He received death threats, and pitches were even thrown directly at his head. But during that 1947 game, as the crowd taunted him, a teammate named Pee Wee Reese, a white man from Kentucky, crossed the field and walked up to Jackie and put his arm around him, and the crowd got quiet. This beautiful example of solidarity has been talked about ever since. This historical moment in sports history has been talked about and discussed in news stories, documentaries, feature films, biographies, articles, and even, get this, got a statue in Brooklyn in 2005. So here comes the Mandela effect. This never happened. There was never a hug. Pee Wee Reese never walked up to Jackie Robinson, never gave him a hug during that game, and this story, apparently, never happened. Despite all the press, articles, stories, movies, biographies, and books, it just didn't happen. This went from one of the most legendary moments in baseball history to one of the most legendary mysteries. As history goes now, Jackie Robinson earned the respect of many of his teammates that year and helped lead his team, the Dodgers, to the World Series, but that on-field hug never happened. It was something that everyone believed happened, but didn't, like a shared memory of an event that never took place. So what are your thoughts on all this? Had you ever heard of the hug before? Did you know that it didn't happen? Or is this all news to you as well? Next, let's talk about a much more modern type of art, the milk mustache. The Got Milk advertising campaign, which ran from 1993 to 2014, was created and used to encourage the consumption of milk in the United States of America. What started as simply an ad in California, later was licensed by milk producers and dairy farmers all across America, all with the express goal of selling more milk. What was really strange about these ads were that they used numerous celebrities, musicians, and athletes to sell milk. And in each of them, they always had a milk mustache. Weird, right? What a strange time in American history. Although, as weird as it is in retrospect, I was a kid and a teen at the time, so I never really stopped to consider how strange any of this was. Anyway, let's talk about the Mandela Effect. A bunch of female famous rock musicians at the time did Got Milk ads. People like Kelly Clarkson and Miley Cyrus. But the weirdest one is the one that apparently no one can find today. And that is the Got Milk ad with Avril Lavigne, the pop punk singer and songwriter that tons of people remember, myself included, but apparently has never existed. The limited details that people have recalled is that she had a white cotton tank top on, apparently suspenders, and that her guitar was in the photo. But that's about it. Go ask anyone who was alive during that time if they remember her doing a Got Milk ad, and more than likely, they will say they remember it. But as far as we can tell, it doesn't exist, and apparently never did. Here's the crazy thing. The Got Milk ads had reached a 90% awareness in America, which is phenomenally successful, meaning 9 out of 10 people had heard of or at least seen one of these Got Milk ads. So the chance of someone seeing one of these ads over the 20 plus years they were made is extremely high. That's what makes this specific Mandela effect so interesting. We have a list of everyone that did one of these ads, and Avril Lavigne isn't one of them. So why do so many of us remember her in one of these ads? People have gone through the backlogs of these Got Milk ads, and there is nothing even similar to what we're describing. I wish I had the answers, but I don't. Either it existed, and somehow all evidence of it has been deleted or lost, or she never actually had a Got Milk ad and all of us are somehow simply misremembering the exact same thing. Here is a fun Bible Mandela effect that I've seen quite a few people online getting confused about. What is the name of the God in the Christian Bible's Old Testament? According to this supposed change, it isn't what you think. The verse in question comes from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 34, verse 14. Finish this quote if you know it. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord 
whose name is blank, is a jealous God. Some of you might think, it's God, or Yahweh, or some other variation of the biblical God's name. But you'd be wrong. The name that has tons of people confused and arguing over is Jealous. The God of the Bible's name is now apparently Jealous. How about that? The full verse goes, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So digging deeper, I looked into other translations to see if it was a mistranslation, and nope, all of them say something similar. The oldest version that I could find, the King James Version, says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. It's pretty weird. Either Jealous was always his name and nobody really noticed it, or something changed. So let's go deeper and older. I went all the way back to the Torah, which is the Jewish holy text. Now the Torah is the first five books of the Christian Old Testament, so let's see what it says. When translated to English, it reads, For you shall not prostrate yourself before another god, because the Lord, whose name is Jealous One, is a jealous god. One last interesting thing before we move on. If you look up names of God in Christianity on Wikipedia and look at the edits, you can see that Jealous was not always on this page. In fact, it was added December 21st, 2017. So what do you think about this? I don't have an opinion on this either way, but I find the confusion and the debate to be pretty interesting. So anyone out there that is religious in this way, In all the time that I've been doing this, I have covered a ton of Mandela effects on my channel, but never before have I had a Mandela effect spawn from a meme. That's right, today we are looking at, at least to me, the very first meme video Mandela effect. So let's see if you've heard of this meme before, and later I'll tell you what apparently changed. There's a great video which started on TikTok, but eventually spread all over the internet of a cat accidentally stepping on piano keys and panicking. And every step that that cat takes to get away from the sudden noise creates a new startling noise and the cat is panicking even more. This video was released in 2020 and there's a good chance that you've seen it. It's funny, everyone loved it, shared it, and moved on to the next meme. I don't know why this recently popped back up into the zeitgeist, but it's back now and people have noticed something weird about it. So much so that internet sleuths have been looking for an alternative video because this couldn't possibly be the original. I'm going to show it to you now, so watch carefully and tell me if you notice anything different about it. <laughs> so what changed in the minds of not only myself, but a ton of people online? Well, it's the giant red box. Not only does it take up a huge amount of the frame, it's also blocking out most of the piano keys. In my memory, the cat steps on all these different keys, and it starts panicking, and you can see it moving back and forth pressing different keys. But now there's a giant box in the way, and you can't actually see most of the piano keys. It's so strange. So here are my questions to all of you. Was it simply such an entertaining video that most of us didn't notice the giant red box? I mean, it's possible, I suppose. But what makes it so strange is the staggering amount of comments reacting to this seemingly innocuous red box. I mean, look at these comments. This isn't even all of them. I actually got tired of screenshotting comments because there were so many people confused about this apparent new addition. So tell me in the comments, what do you all think of this? Was this red box always there? Was this somehow retroactively added in? Is this nothing? Or is this another example to add to the absurdly long list of Mandela effects? In my opinion, that box was not there. I don't know why it's there. It's so strange to me. I personally don't remember this box, but that's just me. Let me hear it all in the comments below. Think of these as quick little bonus effects. First up is how the Great Pyramids now have eight sides instead of four. That one's pretty shocking, even to me. Next is how Richard Simmons is not only missing his headband, but now his wristbands. They're just gone. What happened to them? Last but not least is a quote from Star Wars Episode 3, where tons of people online remember Padme saying, this is how democracy dies, with thunderous applause. But apparently she never said democracy. She said, Liberty. So now, apparently, she says this is how Liberty dies, with a thunderous applause. Online, I have seen so many shocked reactions to this one. Here's a fun one. Remember those character popsicles you probably enjoyed as a kid? Those unfortunately misaligned and melted faces? Gumball eyes in the wrong location? Details slightly or dramatically off? 
It was a good time in retrospect. You wanted a Spider-Man popsicle or a SpongeBob popsicle, but what you got was an abomination. But it was your abomination. Today's Mandela Effect has to do with those popsicles, specifically the Dora the Explorer brand characters. So what is it? Well, it seems that many people remember there being a Boots popsicle, the blue, pink, and yellow colored monkey companion to Dora. People remember this, the colors, the taste, the look of it, but apparently it never existed. No one has found anything yet to prove that it actually did exist either. So tell me, do you remember the Boots the Monkey character popsicle? My first thought while looking for this potential Mandela effect was, okay, Boots is a side character, do they make popsicles of side characters? For example, if they make a Batman popsicle, do they make a Robin popsicle? If they don't make side characters, then this could potentially be debunked. What I found was even weirder. They don't make side character popsicles. They only make adjacent main characters, as in other main characters that share the spotlight. Let me explain. Let's take Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The four main characters all have had popsicles, but the side characters like April O'Neil, Shredder, Master Splinter, none of them got popsicles made of them. Since all four main turtles are technically adjacent, all of them got made into popsicles. So does this mean that all main characters get popsicles? Well, not exactly. Look at Bubbles, one of the three main characters in the Powerpuff Girls. The other two girls are nowhere to be found. All this to say the rules are starting to form. If you are a side character, you don't get a popsicle. If you are a main character or adjacent to a main character, you can potentially get a popsicle. But it doesn't always happen. These rules that are starting to take shape around character popsicles are fascinating because it works perfectly for and against this Mandela effect. Because Boots fits perfectly into the rules. You could argue that Boots was a side character and that he never had a popsicle. But you could also argue that Boots is technically an adjacent main character, meaning he could have had a popsicle, but might not have. Wherever you fall on this Mandela effect, the apparent rules to popsicle character creation could support either argument. But tons of people remember the Boots character popsicle. Yet as far as we can prove, it doesn't exist today and apparently never did. So what do you think? Are people misremembering? Did the Boots popsicle actually exist? Is this a Mandela effect? Let us all hear your most convincing argument in the comments below. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the Nintendo 64 console, released all the way back in 1998. In this game there is a location called the Fishing Pond in Lake Hylia, where you, playing as Link, can relax and fish to your heart's content. The pond owner allows you in, sells you bait, and lets you go wild. Now, there is a legendary fish in this pond that has been discussed, debated, and searched for for as long as people could comment about it online. This is the Hylian Loach, the rarest and most sought after fish in the game. Not only is it hard to find, it's even tougher to catch. So what is the Mandela effect regarding the Hylian Loach? Well, it turns out that the Hylian Loach doesn't exist in Ocarina of Time anymore. Or at least its name doesn't. What so many people remember as the Hylian Loach is now called the Hyrule Loach. And I could understand some people never having heard of this before saying, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but if you spent hours of your youth in that pond fishing for this legendary beast, you know this feels weird and wrong. And if you look up Hylian Loach online, you'll come across numerous guides, game fact pages, and forum posts from back in the day. Comparatively, there are significantly more search results for the Hylian Loach than there are for the Hyrule Loach. So is this simply a case of the majority of people online misremembering this legendary fish's name? Or has something changed? Let's dive deep into this topic. Let's check out the official Nintendo Power Player's Guide for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I'm sure this strategy guide from 1998 will surely solve our mystery. On page 56 and 57, we have an entire spread about Lake Hylia, not Lake Hyrule. So does it mention the loach? Oh yeah. Unfortunately though, it only says this. With the help of a special lore, Link caught the loach, the largest fish the pond has to offer. Meaning this strategy guide mentions the word loach, but not the name that so many people are arguing over. I mean, that's just hilarious. So then I found another strategy guide, an unofficial guide from 1998 by Bradley Games. And it mentions, a huge fish called the loach, but again, no exact name. Incredible. So let's investigate further. It turns out that the Hylian Loach does appear in another Zelda game. The 2006 Nintendo Wii and Nintendo GameCube versions of The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. In this title, the fish is still sporting the name that so many of us remember, the Hylian Loach. In fact, there's even a book in this game, with a joke as a title, called The Legend of the Hylian Loach, Twilight Fish. It's almost like this game is aware of the mystery. Now you might be thinking, okay, these are different fish, who cares? Maybe everyone just got it wrong. 
But then there is a picture in Twilight Princess of the pond owner from Ocarina of Time holding a Hylian loach. I mean, that's as direct a connection to one another as you could make. So let's look at the timeline here. 1998. It's a Hylian loach, or at least people think it is. It's now apparently a Hyrule loach. Next up is 2006. It's now a Hylian loach. So is there any other evidence or residue that it was once called a Hylian loach before 2006? Because right now it's all based off of memories. A photo in Twilight Princess and a bunch of online posts, comments, and videos. Upon doing even more research on this stupid fish, I found something really fascinating. I learned that it was mentioned in another of Nintendo's video games. This game is Animal Crossing for the Nintendo GameCube that was released in 2002. Now, Animal Crossing is one of the most fun and relaxing games ever. Among the many things that you could do in that title, one of those is fish. And if you were lucky enough, you could even catch a loach. Now, in that game, it was simply called a loach. But if you did catch one, you'd receive text on screen that read, I caught a loach. You don't suppose it's Hylian, do you? And there it is, another Nintendo game making a direct reference to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time's rare fish and legendary catch. The timing lines up and the joke only works if everyone thinks that fish is indeed called a Hylian loach. That's right, this text was written after Ocarina of Time, but before Twilight Princess. It is the perfect piece of evidence that at least the localizers and writers at Nintendo of America, the people writing and publishing this game, believe the fish was called a Hylian loach, a name that now doesn't make any sense if there wasn't a Hylian loach until 2006 with Twilight Princess. Why would they make a joke about a Hylian loach if it was never actually called that? Just think about this for a second. There was a fish name in 1998. In 2002, they referenced the fish name, and in 2006 is actually the first time it was ever used now. Why would there be references and jokes to the name that never existed if it didn't exist? In fact, after seeing all this information, I'd argue that the Hylian Loach in Twilight Princess was named that because of the original and now seemingly changed name that never existed. This change is the perfect example of a Mandela effect and the weird ripple effect it creates. The original name in the original game was seemingly and miraculously changed, but its effects and lasting impacts weren't. So does this specifically reveal more insight into the nature of the Mandela Effect? Just think about it. If something in the past changes, but its future references and sequels stay the same, what does this mean? Does this potentially show a limitation of the Mandela Effect, as in the range of how far it can go, the extent to which it can change something, and the limitations of what it can't? Is there a formula here that we can extract and study? If there is, we could possibly use it to more easily search for other Mandela Effects. Have we finally started to crack the case and begin the process of defining and mapping out what a Mandela Effect can and can't do? Whatever it is that the Mandela Effect is, we know it's real, and we know that it changes things. It can add things, and it can subtract things. Some people notice, and some people don't. Even the one study that has been done regarding the Mandela Effect has drawn the conclusion that they don't understand why so many people share such similar memories that are now objectively wrong. There are simply too many for everyone to have forgotten the exact same thing the exact same way. It's unquestionably a thing, but we know so little beyond that. This Mandela Effect has caused a ton of controversy and a lot of debate online. I'm talking about the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES, the console that released in America in 1985. As anyone who has ever owned the system knows, when you insert a game cartridge into the system, you have to press the cartridge down into place before pressing the power button. Only after these steps are completed will the game actually play. And if you messed up any of these steps, or if the 72-pin connector inside the device was damaged, you'd instead get an infuriating red blinking light letting you know it wasn't going to work. Now, I've owned two NESs in my lifetime. One was a brand new console, purchased from a toy store, and the other was one that I purchased years later on the second-hand market because I wanted to experience some nostalgia. Now, after hearing all this, you might be wondering, what is the Mandela Effect regarding this? Here it is. Apparently, you don't have to press the game cartridges down to play them. And not just that, you never have. When I first heard this, I thought, what? There's no way this is correct, but it seems like it is. The games were apparently playable without pressing them all the way down in the system. And if you've never used an NES before, you have no idea how mind-blowing this actually is. It totally changes the functionality of a device people have used for over 35 years. So I've been digging into this topic for days, and it's been really, really strange. I found forum posts from 2008, 2010, 2014, and 2018 of people being confused that their NES systems work without their game cartridges being pushed down all the way. Then on the other side of the internet, I keep finding videos of people saying this is an effect of replacing the 72-pin connector inside the device. 
But surely this isn't just a case of every single NES console out there having its internals replaced, right? You're talking potentially tens of millions of consoles and all of them have had their internals replaced? I suppose it's a possibility, but I've also found Reddit threads and comments from people claiming that they have their original NES consoles from their childhood that have never had anything replaced and now work without pushing down the game cartridges. Weird mysteries like this are always so fun to pursue and try to solve. Honestly, this whole NES situation has had me scratching my head. If I still had either of my NES consoles from back in the day, I'd check them, but I don't. I had the perfect situation to test them too, one original and one previously owned. It's the best test case possible, but alas. Next up, I found a helpful YouTube guide to getting your NES to work if it isn't. Cleaning it, wiggling the cartridge back and forth, etc. You know all the methods. Then randomly, he drops the phrase, so if the cartridge didn't work after sliding it back and forth and cleaning the cartridge, go ahead and push down so that it goes up, but don't remove it. Just leave it like that and then hit power. And sure enough, it works in that position as well. Just leave the cartridge up and turn it on. It works perfectly. This is why we have trust issues. I don't understand how this thing that never worked and has never worked now totally works. I had to go back to the beginning to see if I was really losing my mind. So I looked up an original owner's manual for the Nintendo Entertainment System just to see what it said. Just as I remembered from back then, it says, press down on the game pack until it locks into place and close the chamber lid. There it is, evidence straight from Nintendo that you did indeed have to press the game cartridge down, or game pack as they called it back then, down to get the game to play. Is this just a case of all of these consoles being repaired with aftermarket parts? Has this ability always been there and somehow tens of millions of people just didn't notice? Is it all simply replaced 72-pin connectors that function differently than they should? Malfunctioning hardware across the world? Or has something changed, where you can now play your NES games without pressing down the cartridge? I've seen so much conflicting information on this Mandela effect, my head is spinning. I don't know what this means for the NES, or for this being a potential Mandela effect, but what this does mean is that history used to say you had to press it down, and now that always assumed fact is being questioned. Here is a clever and funny Mandela Effect Easter egg hidden away in the television show Mr. Robot. In Season 3 Episode 4, there is a scene where Darlene is on her laptop and downloading a movie in the background. If you look closely, you'll see that the movie she's downloading is the 1996 movie Shazam, starring Sinbad that doesn't exist and apparently never has. Sure, a lot of us remember it, but no one has found a single trace of it ever existing. One of those really weird ones that I'm not sure will ever be resolved. Regardless of resolution, stuff like this is a fun wink and a nod to fans of the Mandela Effect, and I figured you'd enjoy hearing about it. All the way back in the video Brand New Mandela Effect 7, I talked about The Jungle Book. Let's check out a quick clip from that video to refresh your mind. There is a scene in the 1967 animated classic The Jungle Book where the young human Mowgli is being talked into giving King Louie fire. During this song and dance, the bear, Baloo, joins in wearing an interesting outfit. What outfit is the bear Baloo wearing during the scene? Visualize it right now in your head before I give you some options to choose from. What do you see? Was it a coconut beak and a yellow grass skirt? Or was it a coconut bra and a green grass skirt? As it is now, it's a coconut beak and a yellow grass skirt. This is certainly not what I remember from the Jungle Book, but hey, that's just my opinion. What did you think? The coconut on Baloo's face just looks so off to me. To this day, that's still a pretty big Mandela effect, but now we have definitive proof that Baloo did indeed have a coconut bra, and that something happened at some point to change that. Floyd Norman is an 86-year-old American animator, writer, and comic book artist. He's worked for companies such as Walt Disney Animation Studios, Hanna-Barbera, and even Pixar. This extremely talented man did it all, working on everything from Sleeping Beauty and The Sword in the Stone, to Robin Hood, The Smurfs, Mulan, and even Courage the Cowardly Dog. He even worked on computer-generated movies like Toy Story 2 and Monsters, Inc. All this to say, of course he worked on the 1967 movie, The Jungle Book. I bring up Floyd Norman because years ago he ran a Squarespace website that you can still look up and read to this day thanks to the Internet Wayback Machine, where he talks about his thoughts and feelings on animation, the industry, his dreams, his goals, and lots of insider stories that you'll never hear anywhere else. In a post he wrote called Things You Don't Know About The Jungle Book, Floyd delves into all kinds of fun details that most people have never heard of. For example, originally the Jungle Book story was, quote, dark, dreary, and full of mystery. So after Walt Disney himself viewed the storyboards, Walt yelled out, this reminds me of Batman. 
Apparently this was a shock to the team of artists because none of them ever expected a DC reference from Walt Disney. They even used to gossip back then that maybe Walt Disney was a secret DC Comics fan. Floyd's website has a ton of great details like that, but the one that really caught my attention was regarding Baloo and his now missing coconut bra. Here is his entire quote. Veteran writer Larry Clemens thought having animated characters in drag was a surefire gag. Every time the story team would come up with a wacky idea, Larry would always chime in and say, what if we put him in drag? That would be hilarious. Eventually, Larry managed to get his way. When Baloo the bear has his wacky I want to be like you duet with King Louis the orangutan, we put Baloo in a coconut bra and grass skirt. I think we finally managed to please Larry, and perhaps he was right after all. The zany duet between Louis, Prima, and Phil Harris was a genuine showstopper. There you have it, an artist that literally worked on the Jungle Book, as in drawing that animated classic with his own two hands has confirmed that Baloo the bear was indeed wearing a coconut bra, like so many of us remember. I mean, this is straight from the horse's mouth. You don't get any more accurate than a first-hand account. This is like if I was commenting on the production of an all-time scary video. I'm the person that would know best. This leaves all of us with a couple questions. Where is the coconut bra? What happened to it? If tons of people that watched that movie remember it, and one of the artists that worked on it remembers it as well, then where did it go? Perhaps it was Disney censorship and all the original copies were scrubbed from existence. But you'd think that at least one would survive if that was the case, or at least a clip of it. This kind of gag at the time wasn't controversial. And if it was scrubbed from existence at some point after, you'd assume that someone out there would have knowledge of that, right? Not to mention Disney as a company has never admitted to changing anything regarding this movie and it's still viewable on even Disney+.